evening, everybody. Opening statements today in the murder trial of real estate heir Robert Durst. Durst is accused of killing his friend Susan Berman in December 2000 because prosecutors think she helped Durst cover up evidence that he had killed his wife Kathleen in February 1982. Prosecutors say Berman was ready to go to the police, so Durst killed her to shut her up. Kathy Durst's body has never been found. Durst appeared in court today wearing hearing aids. He's 76 years old, soon to be 77 in about a month. He's watching the court reporter's transcript of the proceedings because he's hard of hearing. Durst's murder prosecution began to unfold after the HBO film The Jinx ended with this surreptitiously recorded set of statements from the defendant. The defense has argued that they're edited out of context. There it is, your court. Right, of course. But you can't imagine. What's in the house? Oh, I want this. Prosecutor John Lewin immediately sought to tie the Susan Berman killing to the killing of Kathleen Durst and to another alleged killing of Morris Black. Durst pleaded guilty to evidence tampering for dismembering Black's body, but the lack of a higher conviction did not deter Prosecutor John Lewin today. This case involves what the people are going to present as three different homicide cases, and in fact, three different murders. The killing Kathy Durst, the killing of Susan Berman, and the killing of Morris Black. Susan lived in an area of Benedict Canyon, which has a Beverly Hills address. This is Susan's house. These are photographs that were taken the day that the officers responded. That's Susan's old Isuzu trooper in the driveway. That is a uh, police car, likely a detective vehicle. Officer Sharif is going to tell you that when you respond to a call like this, the last thing you are expecting, this is a very low crime neighborhood, is to walk in on a homicide case. So again, officers always need to be ready, but they're not expecting to find what in fact they're going to see inside. Lewin walked the jury through the details of the scene and then focused on the note he says the defendant wrote to the Beverly Hills Police Department. This letter, which has commonly been referred to as the cadaver note, was mailed to the Beverly Hills Police Department prior to Susan's body being found. So meaning that there'll be a postmark from the, uh, from the 23rd and her body is not gonna be found until the 24th. So inside the envelope was this cryptic note and all it says is 1527 Benedict Canyon and it has the word cadaver. A cadaver is a very interesting term. It's not a term that you're going to find and that you've probably seen in your own lives that a lot of people use generally. There are people that use it. The evidence is going to show that when someone goes to medical school, they are literally given a cadaver. That happens generally in your first year of medical school. And that is what you work on. That's how you learn anatomy. And the evidence will show that Bob Durst's wife, Kathy, had been in medical school while she was married to Bob Durst. That is why that word was used.
Prosecutors played a video showing one of Durst's longtime friends at a pretrial hearing conducted in secret. That friend is expected to testify at this trial that Durst talked to him about killing Susan Berman. Durst is alleged to have said, I had to, it was her or me. As long-term best friends, I mean, they went back to UCLA in their friendship. Would Bob Durst ever tell you um, anything about how he felt about Susan? Just that they were very close. I mean, we both would laugh about her eccentricities and, 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 and such, but uh, they were very, very close. And with what you saw, did you believe that those feelings were reciprocated? Yes. Susan often told me the same thing. And when you said Susan would tell you the same thing, what would Susan tell you about? How much she loved Bobby. Given the closeness of Bobby and Kathy's relationship, I'm sorry, Bobby and Susan's relationship, is there anything that you can think of that Susan would not have done for Bob? No. Prosecutor Lewin has personally interviewed nearly every single witness in this case. Some he talked to more than once. He continued to admit videos of his recordings into these opening statements, and then the defense objected. Lorraine Newman was another close friend of Susan Berman's, and Lorraine is also going to come in and testify, and she is also going to describe the closeness of Bob Durst's relationship with Susan. Hey, Lorraine, who was... Susan closest to, or who would she talk about the most? Who would that have been? Um, it was Bobby. Let me ask you, in terms of the way she would talk about him, if I were to say, describe the relationship as you knew it to be. From they Susan. were very, very close. They were best friends. Your Honor, may I inquire? I don't believe this is from the testimony. This is this is a, simply an interview. I don't think that's admissible. Uh, a recording. This is uh, what's on the screen. is just a uh, still photograph. So what was played for the jury was a recording of an interview that Mr. Lewin did. That's not admissible evidence. You know the objection is sustained. You uh, may describe what a witness may say. You may quote what the witness uh, will say. But you may, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, but you may reiterate what this uh, what this witness will say. The prosecution will be allowed to argue that Durst uh, coerced his wife into having an abortion. In 2010, movie producers asked Durst about Kathy applying to medical school as well as he sat and watched the film All Good Things, where he was portrayed. It, it, it encouraged her to do so, but with a big uh, caveat that the people who go to medical school get real, real good grades, do real good on the MCATs. They, they mostly come from much better colleges than you went to. Um, you want to do it, do it. She applied to 15 of them and got interviewed and accepted. On the screen is a movie. This is improper. The court has already admitted the all good things to be shown to the jury. I would ask Mr. DeGaron to object to things that have not already been litigated in the middle of my opening. Well, I ask that they not cherry pick from hours and hours and hours of interviews. You present what you want to present, and I'll present what I want to present. The court instruct Mr. Lewin that he's not supposed to direct his comments to other counsel. I believe Mr. DeGaron just directed a comment to me, Your Honor. It needs to go both ways. Okay. Attorneys Terry Austin and Tiffany Simmons are with me here in New York. So, Tiffany, they really got into it there. Is this called for? And we're only on day one of this proceeding. Right. We are in day one of this. Um, like I was saying to, to um, Terry earlier, like, what, who else would do this? What makes more sense in this? I think the state is focusing on a lot of details that is getting away from the case at hand. So, Terry... And so the fight back and forth there, this introduction of all these interview clips into the opening statements, it makes it easy for the jury to watch and they see faces and they connect words with mouths and names and it can help the jury, I think, but is it really a good idea? And we're starting to see the defense complain about it. Exactly. And I was wondering when the defense would complain about it. Lots of clips, probably too much. He should be telling a story in the opening about what happened, not going to all these interviews. 
interviews. And I was wondering why the judge allowed these clips to be introduced when probably the best evidence would be the witnesses themselves. Yeah, sometimes it's more helpful, Terry, to actually like tell a clean story. This is the victim's story. This is what she did that day. This is why it happened. Broaden it out, implicate the defendant, and then stop. Just, just lay out a clean narrative rather than to try to litigate the entire case during opening statements, which are expected to last at least two days for the state. Exactly, and I wondered why he did that, and I think he lost the jury in doing so. The people probably couldn't even follow who was being interviewed or where it came from. And you saw that there was a clip from the movie itself, not even the documentary. So there was just too many moving parts. A lot of movies also made about this case. This case has been in the press for what now? Three decades here. So That's Tiffany, nice. why is the prosecutor going and interviewing all of these witnesses personally? Doesn't that make him a potential witness himself and potentially muddy up the proceeding? Well, it possibly could because um, as, as much as he interacts with these potential witnesses, um, yeah, it possibly could. And I, I think that he needs to be careful with that. And Tiffany, you have to ask about the tactic of lumping all the three killings into this trial, the three alleged killings here. We've got all of that in together. Is that a risky move for the prosecution? Because, I mean, Durst had the plea in, in the, uh, the, the gentleman's killing, but uh, it, it wasn't like a murder conviction or anything like that. And now the prosecutor is turning around and basically just saying, no, 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 Durst flat out killed the guy. Right, right. I think it is very dangerous lumping three different cases together. Um, as we've seen over these years of this case being in the media, we know Durst is a criminal. So to bring in these three cases, I agree with what you said earlier. We need to focus on the victim in this particular case and present a clean story about her, not a story about Durst. Common sense, guys. And introducing a lot of different interviews that affects the common sense that the jury is going to use. But of course, Terry, it's helpful to have a motive if you're the prosecutor, and that is exactly the story the prosecutor is telling. So is it a strong or a weak case based on what we know today? I think the prosecution has a very strong case, and it is a motive. You know, his wife disappeared in 1982. He told his best friend that his wife disappeared and maybe that he killed his wife. Then Morris Black lived next door to him, and for whatever reason, we see Durst get rid of that individual. Now, frankly, the jury didn't say he murdered him, but he did dismember his body. And in my view, if you can chop a body up, chances are you probably murdered the person. Well, that is the state's theory, of course, and the defense gets to give its opening statement on Monday at the earliest in that case. Other stories now. Law and Crime founder Dan Abrams has a new book out called John Adams Under Fire. He spoke about the Boston Massacre trial involving one of the nation's founding fathers earlier today on the Law and Crime Network. Five colonists are killed by British soldiers. The colonists were furious. The soldiers get put on trial. No one wants to represent them. John Adams agrees to take the case. And this is where we get the, the phrase, Facts are stubborn things. Uh, it's where we got the legal standard of reasonable doubt. Um, and it becomes a really critical case in American history. And that's why we focused on and because it's a transcript. The fact there's a 217 page transcript of this case from from 1770s. And there's a comparison to to law and crime in the sense that, you know, what we're doing here is we're covering trials in really controversial cases. It can assure people the system is working. That's what this transcript did. It takes you back back then to see the words of the lawyers and the witnesses, I think, is what calmed the anger and prevented uh, what could have been violence. Wise words from the boss. And still ahead tonight, a five-year-old child strangled to death. Authorities say by his own mother, his or her defense rather, is that this death was a tragic accident. We break down opening statements and testimony after this break. An Iowa mother is accused of strangling her five-year-old daughter to death. Prosecutors say the defendant confessed to the killing, but her defense is that the confession was coerced. 
Firefighters found Chloe Thomas dead in her bedroom on July 19th, 2018. Her mother, Kelsey Thomas, says she told detectives she put Chloe down for a nap around 1.30 and then settled down for a nap herself. Thomas says she woke up two hours later to get ready for work and that Chloe was not in her room. She checked the closet and found her daughter's body. In opening statements, prosecutors described that first police interview and when the defendant changed her statements in a second interview. You hear on the video how she specifically notes that Chloe is hanging from pajama pants. That she lifts Chloe from the closet, those pajama pants that not just comes undone on its own. And she takes her to Chloe's bed where ravioli comes out of her mouth through vomit because Chloe had eaten ravioli for lunch that day. And you'll learn how Chloe doesn't behave. She goes out of her room when she's not supposed to. She tries getting food from the kitchen when she's not supposed to. She gets into the cabinets as a five-year-old, isn't supposed to. And then Kelsey will tell you how frustrated, got angry, and looped the pajama pants around Chloe's neck and tightened, possibly twisted, and started choking Chloe. Kelsey will also tell you how Chloe's body <laughs> It was a bit of a struggle, and then she started twitching, and then went limp. The defense promised to prove five-year-old Chloe Thomas died from a tragic accident. Kelsey Thomas, through days of hard questioning and interrogation, confessed in a way that should leave you folks trouble with how the facts actually line up with this final story as well. And it's... Again, that confession piece is so hard to get past, right? False confessions are a real life thing. And in this case, you folks are gonna hear from Dr. Brian Cutler, who is an expert on interrogation and false confessions. Brian Cutler is going to tell you about how he reviewed the interrogation of Kelsey Thomas. He's gonna tell you about the many known risk factors for false confession that existed during that interrogation. Dr. Cutler will testify that while he can't tell you if Kelsey Thomas is telling the truth, because nobody can tell you if Kelsey Thomas was actually telling the truth, he'll testify that in his expert opinion, that interrogation created an environment which would encourage both an innocent and guilty person to confess. The defendant's mother said she used to call her granddaughter Peanut. She said Chloe received less attention from her parents after the defendant gave birth to a second child. She would be having a hard time getting Chloe to listen. And I just told her to try to spend as much time as she could with her. And why did you tell her that? Because I thought maybe if she spent more time with her and paid more attention with her that she would stop being a brat. She pretty much told me to take Chloe. And what was your response? I said, no, you would miss her too much. And why did you say that? I would miss her. How did you find out about Chloe's death? One of Kelsey's ex-boyfriends called me. On that day, did Kelsey try to reach out to you in any way? No. I called Kelsey. It would have been between 8 and 8.30. I asked her what she was doing, and she said she was eating. And I said, how's Chloe? And she said, how did you find out? The defendant's cousin agreed to wear a wire for the police. She testified that she was bothered by what the defendant said the day after the daughter died. Um, she explained things that were odd that Chloe reminded her of her father, that she would get out of hand, that she would make her upset, things that a grieving mother wouldn't normally, in my opinion, express. Did she tell you anything about Chloe's attitude? That she was not very controllable, that she got on her nerves, things of that nature. And during that conversation, did she say anything to you about how it was sometimes hard to look at Chloe because she looked like Stephen? Yes, she said that she could not look at her because she reminded her of her father. I did ask her um, how did the... Kelsey tell 
She said that she must have accidentally hung herself and she proceeded to explain how she thought it happened. But during that time, I had asked to enter the residence once we had parked and she told me that she wouldn't go back in because she had just watched her daughter die. Did you specifically ask Kelsey how the pants were? I did. And what did she tell you? That she had tied them into a knot up above the rod, creating a loop, almost like a swing. Our guests are with us one final time this evening. Tiffany Simmons, it's so difficult to deal with a case like this when you have a child who's died. But again, my focus is always on whether the state has proven its case beyond a reasonable doubt. Here we've got admissions and then potentially more admissions to relatives. And when that adds up, you can put a million experts on the stand. It's hard to erase that. Exactly. Um, in this case, like I said earlier, it kind of reminds me of the Casey Anthony case, unfortunately. Um, you have an, a mother who we see just doesn't want to be a mom um, and gets rid of her child. So in, in this case, I, I am going to su be surprised if there is a um, not guilty verdict, but she should be found guilty. Well, there was a not guilty verdict in the Casey Anthony case. Exactly. So you, you never know what might happen here. Maybe we'll get enough experts on the stand. It's just sort of bothering to me, though, Terry, to hear days of interrogation. That, that word days stuck out to me. Days of interrogation? and saying that there were days of interrogation is basically just trying to say that the admissions that the defendant made were not legitimate, that she was worn down and that's why she ultimately sort of, you know, admitted to doing this. But I think, I mean, looking back at the testimony there on the stand of the cousin, the fact that she actually admitted to the cousin why she might be doing this because the child reminded her of her ex and the child was unruly. So I think that those are sort of consciousness of guilt, if you ask me. Yeah, I mean, that's the way I would probably take it if I were sitting on the jury. But a couple of things here with that cousin's testimony. Uh, Tiffany, the, the cousin said, enter the residence. That sounds like police language, not what a relative would say. Can the defense go at this and say she was coached? Of course, um, but will that help the defense? So I don't know if they should go after her because she is a witness that's kind of impartial, that's showing that, hey, the family did care for baby Chloe and we want to see what happened. So if I were the defense, I don't know if I would touch on the fact that she used police jargon, because let's face it, she did speak with the police after this. She has interacted exactly. with them. Exactly. Good insight from Terry and Tiffany. Glad to have you with us here on The Debrief. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 5.